Race, Law, and Justice in the Reconstruction Era. Thank you for coming this afternoon. And I thought I would just open uh, by setting the context of this story so that you can see what I saw when I ran across this story in the 1870s newspapers and recognized that no one had ever written about it before and uh, seized the opportunity to bring this story back uh, to your attention. And uh, the story begins in June of 1870, when a white baby is abducted uh, from uh, an Irish immigrant family who lived in a swampy part of New Orleans called the Back of the Town, which is, uh, was where the Superdome sits today. And normally, in a city uh, filled with crime, even that day, there were murders. Things. This would just be another uh, page, uh, page three C intelligence uh, column story. But the rumor begins to circulate that the baby has been abducted for use as a voodoo sacrifice. And the voodoo practitioners in New Orleans did use the new freedoms they found after the Civil War to start practicing their religion more openly. And they would have a big celebration and cheer on Lake Pontchartrain and St. John's Eve in a couple of weeks. Uh, in the future from when the baby was abducted. And this storyline started to circulate in the newspapers, uh, both in New Orleans and along the Gulf Coast. And that's what first caught my eye. I was doing other research against the baby abducted that for the moon sacrifices can't possibly be true. And uh, as it made the newspaper, it quickly got sucked into the politics of reconstruction. 1870 was the height of radical reconstruction in New Orleans. You had, for the first time, African Americans serving in the state legislature, serving in other government positions, serving on juries, serving on the city's police force. And the white press used this kidnapping uh, to protest reconstruction generally and to argue that this is what we could expect to happen, these kinds of crimes, now that the city was said that it had been Africanized. And a number of the elite white women in the city who normally were told to uh, stay away from politics, anybody about politics, saw in this case an angle to express their dissatisfaction with Reconstruction uh, because it had the story of a mother whose child was stolen and they started uh, bringing food and, and, and going in groups to the Dickies house in a park town and normally never would go. And they go to the mansion of the Reconstruction governor, 28-year-old so-called carpetbagger, Henry Clay Warman, and demand he do something to solve this crime. And Warman uh, will actually take the bait. He wants to prove that his newly integrated police force can solve this kidnapping. Uh, and that African American policemen would not sort of wink at crimes committed by black people against uh, white people. And he puts up a reward, which is going to turn this kidnapping case into the Powerball of the summer of 1870, because everybody who sees a African American nanny with a white baby is going to say, "No, oh, there's Molly Baby," and he tried to claim the reward. And the story goes out of the AP wire. And show up in the New York Times and other places. Leads are going to come in from as far away as Cincinnati and other cities. And uh, Governor Woolman, to prove that his police force is up to the task, is going to ask his police chief, Algernon Sidney Thatcher, to appoint his best black detectives to the case, including one who I feature in my book because he'd be central to the investigation, Detective Jean Baptiste Jordan, an Afro Creole former uh, cigar maker from the French Quarter who is now a detective. And this is the moment in American life where detectives have become the most glamorous figures in law enforcement, starting in the city of Boston in 1848, popularized in the short stories by like Joe Allen Poe and the National Police Gazette. Uh, and uh, everywhere people are reading these stories of detectives using disguise and power of production and all these things to solve crimes, but nowhere 
had there been until reconstruction in the South black detectives. Most in, in the North, there's not even black police. In New York City, we're not even black police until 1911. So this is the deep South with black detectives in 1870. And Jean Baptiste Jordan, one of these Afro Creoles, is going to play an essential role in helping uh, define the women that they will eventually accuse of this crime. Uh, and that uh, is the first part of the story, the search for Molly Dippy and her kidnappers. And then the second part of the story is a uh, classic southern courtroom drama in a sweltering heat of August, uh, at the time of the yellow fever epidemic in 1870, uh, where these two uh, uh, strikingly stylish and educated African-American women are put on trial and accused of abducting so part of the story is just a great story. I stumbled across it. I was like, how could no one have ever written about this before? But on a second level, when I'm a history professor, we always add a, 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 a second level. I truly think it is an excellent window into the history of Reconstruction. And Reconstruction is an era about which uh, there's sort of been a national amnesia, despite the best efforts since the late 50s of historians like Karen Stamp, Eric Foner, and Laura Edwards to bring, uh, to, to tell a different story of Reconstruction than the one we see in Gone with the Wind, the fourth part of the nation of uh, greedy carpetbaggers and scalawags hoisting a terrible Reconstruction tragedy upon the South, but to argue that it was a much more complex era than some of the who came from the North who truly believed they were doing God's work, they trying to establish a new racial, political, social, and economic order. And that in, embedded in this story uh, are lots of uh, insights into Reconstruction that you wouldn't get unless you try to live life on the ground. I tried to write this book as a kind of an immersive experience where you're trying to see what it would have been like to be on the ground the kidnapping case unfolds in the midst of this heated period in American politics, and in the case that it's tied up with reconstruction politics. And one of the things I argue is that you can see some signs in this case that reconstruction might possibly have worked. We have this, uh, we know we know it doesn't, we know it fails, we know the nation the South descends into the era of Jim Crow that will last until the civil rights movement. Uh, and you just assume that it's doomed from the beginning, that you were asking that Southern society change too fast, too quickly. And uh, I'm arguing that it, it might have worked. And there are portions of this story that reflect that. So it's really a two level story, a whodunit and kind of classic Southern Portland trial, but also a way of introducing people who either don't know anything about Reconstruction. Or have hold the old view when you talk to people, let's say, over the age of 55, many of them are taught in school the old version of Reconstruction. Or people uh, uh, who uh, know, know something about it, uh, but for whom it, it does, it, it, it uh, kind of seems one dimensional. I'm hoping this book is it's a window to a period uh, that we just will enjoy reading, but at the same time, uh, giving us history of uh, Reconstruction. Process. So that's the idea of the book, and I'm um, uh, welcome to your uh, questions. Yes? Hi. Um, so, when I first started reading this book, I was not surprised. I, I knew that Creoles had had better sort of rights in the South than maybe that African Americans did elsewhere in the South. But I was sort of surprised that. I don't know that everything became quite as inflamed. Is the, is the only reason that, that the case ended up going in because there was some rights established there for them? Or so she's asking about the Afro Creoles, and she had known something about them. The Afro Creoles are an incredibly interesting class. They are descendants of the original uh, colonists in New Orleans, but of the French colony. Often their family group both white and black members, often as a result of relationships between rich uh, uh, French uh, men and women who they often uh, live with openly and treat as partners, even though interracial marriage was illegal. And then they have children whom they get money to 
to, et cetera. Who, uh, both, you know, the Americans in the New World see this whole thing as an abomination. But they're given rights that enslaved people and other three persons and three persons of color in the South don't have. They're able to sue and be sued. They're able to uh, give testimony in court. And many of them are uh, businessmen, merchant, merchants, uh, skilled artisans, there's doctors, there's poets, there's musicians. And this class plays a central role in the story because uh, one of the reasons I think New Orleans is a place where reconstruction is going to work and have a real good chance is they are going to become the people that as reconstruction unfolds, the Republicans are going to be appointed to the police force and are going to get elected to the state legislature and their education and their uh, gentility, but puts the lie to whites who argue that African Americans are too ignorant in all of these uh, positions. And uh, so the, the, the question is when we get to the trial phase, is this really a story just about Afro Creoles who are, are accused of a crime, or is it a story of race in general? And I think it's a, a blend of both. There's no question. Uh, that uh, the press of today recount this story, both uh, the press that wants to see these women convicted and the people who are sympathetic to them are, are so impressed by these women and their demeanor and their uh, how cool they are under pressure that it affects the story in a way it might not if, it was, if, you know, if, it, if they were former slaves. Uh, who did not have the same uh, narrowly bearing. Can you talk a little bit about reconstruction in New Orleans specifically? Was it represented? Was it different than reconstruction in the rest of the South? Well, it's different than reconstruction in a lot of the South. New Orleans wasn't destroyed during the war, but uh, much of the South was. New Orleans has the Afro Creole, so does Mobile, but much of the South doesn't. Uh, New Orleans has lots of uh, businessmen who had actually opposed secession, New Orleans votes against uh, seceding, uh, but then goes when the rest of Louisiana goes. Uh, and uh, the Republicans were counting on trying to build a coalition of businessmen who might be willing to put uh, economic development ahead of race hatred and on the Afro Creoles uh, to create kind of a model reconstruction government that would show. The South and the nation of reconstruction work. So it, it's different from the rest of the South, but it's also a place where everyone is looking. I don't know what in other uh, places and towns where we where we try to create a new society, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan. There's certain places you look and say, is it working? And newspaper readers in the North and South would be looking at New Orleans to see if reconstruction could uh, succeed there. Uh, because it's the, the, it's the South Carolina city and it also has all these unique factors. Yes? Uh, among the Afro Creoles, how much uh, cultural connection was there with France? Uh, but how much cultural connection is there with France? There's a lot, actually. Uh, they're very proud of their uh, Franco from heritage. Some of them that resources, send their children to private school in France. Others educate their children in private academies in New Orleans. Uh, and the entire Creole class, both white and Afro-Creole, see, they, they all see themselves as being in the same boat as they're now being, simple, since the Louisiana Purchase, being overwhelmed by what they see as these crass American the Kentucky black boatmen and these uh, Yankee skin flints and, and Irish immigrants that are coming in that are, and, and they see themselves as preserving the kind of a, a true New Orleans culture and, and French culture. They gods in New Orleans at this time. Uh, and uh, you, you, when you read the, the, the letters of like the, the uh, Francis ambassador in New Orleans, He's always writing about how the Creoles are trying to hang on to making this a French city. There's French language newspapers, New Orleans B is all in French. Uh, but it is kind of the end of it, it, the end of the year, but they'll soon be all overwhelmed by the Americans, by Americans' racial mores, uh, etc. So the Paris Company, the beginning of the Paris Company, um, resonance. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, uh, so the, Bar the Paris Commune had residents across uh, the country. Uh, I would argue, uh, while it's not, I think some of the Afro Creoles see it as a kind of a, a rising of peoples that they would identify with, they identify with French revolutionary figures. They have seances where they call Robespierre and people uh, to life. They actually bring in a clairvoyant in the Victor case to try to help solve the uh, crime of Afro Creoles love spiritualism. Uh, but across the United States, the, the, in uh, an emerging Gilded Age society, uh, a lot of people are afraid of Paris Commune. They see the, the, the war between rich and poor growing in intensity and fear of the United States is headed in that direction. Yeah? How did Boone play into the media's perception? How did play into the media's perception of the case? Again, uh, voodoo and how it was uh, perceived in New Orleans was very complex. The practitioners of voodoo uh, did not consider themselves to be kind of uh, you know, spooky people. They considered themselves to be practicing Catholics. And when uh, Spain and France controlled the main cathedral in New Orleans, the one still standing today, St. Louis Cathedral, they allowed uh, the practitioners of voodoo to build voodoo altars in St. Louis uh, cathedral because they saw it as kind of a syncretic brand of Catholicism. Uh, and, but the uh, uh, voodoo uh, priests and priestesses uh, were both used by the press to, uh, to paint African Americans as superstitious people, uh, you know, who believe in spells and paganism. And at the same uh, time, uh, many whites would go uh, secretly to the homes of leading voodoo practitioners for uh, medical uh, 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 you know, solutions, etc. But whenever you had, uh, and, and these cases show up in court, uh, people putting spells on people, greed, greed, and these uh, very uh, kind of spooky altars, they build them up on some doorstep to intimidate them. Much of the white press would try to paint that in, in and all African Americans in the media realize kind of these feminine people who are these feminine brands. Can you talk about your research a little bit? What did you find? What was it like to research all of this? And what did you find surprising or shocking when it comes to research? Sure. Uh, this is uh, uh, my first book. Um, I'm sure all of you read the biography of the Supreme Court Justice in the 19th century. Uh, and it was a uh, kind of a very traditional dissertation in which I you had access to reams of people's papers at the Library of Congress and all kinds of stuff. And this is the first book I've ever written where almost all of the main characters are people who, other than this case, have left very little historical and in on the bones of these long forgotten people who needle in a haystack reports in newspapers that got involved in some litigation, finding their wills, finding their property, finding uh, you know anything you could find. And I gained immense respect, immense, for family genealogists, for social historians who've been doing this for a long time. It's fun, it's like detective work, but incredibly painstaking. And I know how much uh, research this is going to take. I, I, I would perhaps be here Perhaps not speaking about Justice Roger Tommy as my next subject, uh, but it really is kind of fun. Uh, and uh, it, amidst that, your question is what I found shocking. One of the more uh, uh, interesting uh, things I, I found is as I trace these characters beyond my story and what happened to them, all kinds of interesting things uh, uh, came about. And Part of what I learned about what happened to my characters came from the fact that as I started giving conference papers and things on this, I started to get emails from descendants of people who were part of the story. And I had for a time, because I've never been aware of it, but I was the one person alive who knew anything about it. And then I got to get these emails. And one family of a, a, a woman uh, who's a, a Wall Street person, uh, uh, had also stumbled into this story through her genealogical research. And they had realized for the first time that they not only that they had black forebears, like family, 
Uh, but that their black forebears were the women who were accused of the crime in this story. So they too stumbled into this story doing their research. And what we found is that their descendants, uh, the, the women who were accused, because they were kids when they were arrested, had left New Orleans and after the case moved to the north and passed with white. And over time, uh, their family became white. So it's sort of one of these white videos. These stories of, in the age of passing in the late 19th century, where people left the South and the Jim Crow era and passed for white in the North. And uh, one of the family members of, uh, of that older variety was quite angry at this one, not being discovered and announced. Uh, but everyone else is fascinated. Uh, and uh, when you look at their family photographs, uh, quite interesting. You're, you can see this passing coming to it in the realm of uh, photographs. Uh, another family contacted me who, doing their family research, realized that I was writing about John Baptiste Jordan, who they were starting to also uh, figure out who he was and what he did. Then it turned out uh, to be the Bat Cave family, a famous New Orleans Africa Creole family, a famous family of restaurant tours. They owned a restaurant. And that's the thing that happened. We're also a little busy since you may have seen the show Trine, the kind of place where the power brokers of New Orleans go for lunch. And uh, uh, it's this famous set of brothers between the King Back and the New Orleans family, the descendants of what I have the first African American detective to make national news in American history in my uh, story. And uh, the descendants of the family whose child was abducted uh, are around everywhere as well. And I met with some of them, and one of them uh, emerged, uh, came to the meeting with a box full of their family documents about the case, their memories of the case. And it's extraordinary. They're pulling this down. No way. No way. No way. <laughs> and uh, as it turns out, some of their memories are. I, Sad to tell them are historically incorrect, but track perfectly with American historiography about reconstruction. So their own memory of what had happened to their family are shaped by the national memory of reconstruction. One of the things they believe, which uh, I wish was true, is they were convinced, uh, they're, they're coming from the flip side, they were convinced that Queen Victoria read about the case. And offered her own reward of five thousand dollars for the return, and they even went to Harvard the archives in England looking for uh, examples of Queen Victoria. I really wish that was true. It's awesome, but I, I could not find any evidence in the papers in England or in the United States of that being the case. So when it happened, uh, it was done very quietly. Again, what the, what initially captures everyone's attention is the conclusion of the kidnapping. That's that the sensationalism. But why, why uh, the, the key to it continuing and then becoming a national story that's reported in the New York Times and Chicago Tribune and all these other papers is that it gets sucked into the maelstrom of Reconstruction politics. And becomes this case that everyone is weaving it, uh, is weaving it for either to see that they're hoping reconstruction will succeed, will just be an example of an integrated police force with a dashing black detective solving a sensational crime, or will this be a case that reflects what the light press was saying about? Yes? Um, I know the book that you said several years to write, and that country that happens in the middle. And a lot of documents were swamped. Please tell us a little bit about. Yeah, sadly, yeah, sadly, some of the uh, archives I was working in uh, flooded during Hurricane Katrina, including some of the uh, original newspapers. The fun. This was these were the old news. Reading them day to day, just there were some in 1870. The Victorial archives of New Orleans flooded. Luckily, the city archives did not. But a lot of material I was working with had to be freeze dried, sent to Switzerland where they had a company that, that fixes flooded documents. 
And I, I don't know if they're back in use yet, but it, the bats and uh, hurting training have been really destroying the city. Slow things down a little bit for the research. Yes? Was the class an issue in the case? Yes. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's an excellent question. Was class a big issue in the case? And again, it's all, it's all particularly in the efforts of uh, the Afro-Creoles have long saw themselves as being in the class, in the best class in the world, the same manners uh, and gentility as elite whites. And they use that to distinguish themselves from former slaves, from poor whites, etc. And the, the reason why they're why Jean Baptiste Jordan, besides the fact that he's educated and uh, you know, very smart, is picked as detective, is because they represent exactly the kind of class of people that the Republican government is hoping will uh, is hoping will prove to white businessmen that this whole thing can work. You know, you're not being overwhelmed by this is not a poor person's reconstruction. And uh, class will also play a role in the trial of the accused women, where even uh, their critics are so impressed by the, the, this, the demeanor, style, intelligence uh, of, of the women. So class, the fingerprints of class are, are all of our own. No way. Uh, you know, just, just like I read in the book, I, I cite just the crimes that happened in the world that same day. And today, any of them would you know, leave the local news. But then there, if, it had, if a crime happened in, in the immigrant neighborhoods, in the concert saloons, in a poor neighborhood, in the docks, it's just, it gets reported and it disappears in the uh, But in this case, it gets traction for the, the reasons we've talked about. It. I think first, reconstruction politics, but then some class issues also which shape the fascination. And this is standing room only crowds in August in New Orleans for a trial. Where, you know, you can, I don't know if you've been in New Orleans in August. I lived there for 10 years, we could not romanticize about it. I romanticize New Orleans all the time in the city, but August is hard to uh, And there's standing room over the crowds every day uh, to see the resolution of this trial. Yes? One type of response has there been in Louisiana a day one uh, well, I mean, it, it, but what kind of responses have been, or is the book too new? Well, the book is brand new, uh, but I have, you know, presented conference papers. I have uh, discussed it till, with friends in Louisiana until they can't uh, uh, take it anymore. Uh, uh, and I think people uh, are fascinated. What, what everyone loves about New Orleans uh, is you think you have the place figured out. And you scratch a little deeper on the surface and it gets even more complex. It's just one of these places where everyone's family heritage is complex, where the politics, where the, 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 the society is so complex that uh, I think New Orleans have an endless fascination with, with their own history. And something new is always coming up. And uh, they would like the Vecchese as well to find out that they are descended from the first black detective in American history. So the reception's been good so far. Cross your fingers. <laughs> Somehow, but I can add an uh, addendum to that, so, which is there are still some people who are uh, deeply wet to the traditional narrative of the construction. That it was a tragedy foisted on a defeated South by the federal government backed by uh, Union bayonets and like weedy carpetbaggers who were coming down just to get rich off of the defeated South and some poor whites that they uh, uh, bamboozled into joining them and so-called ignorant former slaves voiced this terrible tragedy on the South that deserved to end and that Jim Crow was a necessary response to that. And that was taught in I mean, textbooks till the 50s. 
So if you have anyone in your family who went to school before you know, 1958, that's what they learned about in North and South about the reconstruction history. And you still run into people of that generation, but even some young people raised in, in homes where reconstruction is uh, discussed, who resist a different version of reconstruction. And some of them do read this. Okay, great. I hope you'll all read the book. I look forward to your comments. Feel free to email me.